Well, welcome. We're going to start talking about the inlay onlay myths and realities. I'm Howard Roundman from the Palm Beach, Florida, and uh, this is the topic of our discussion. There is a, a lot of talk about the word onlay, and I think that uh, there are a lot of folks that use it almost as though it's a bad word. And I think that uh, we, we have there's plenty of data that supports the the use of onlay, and actually some that suggest that it might even be better for certain stuff. Uh, we have a great panel tonight. Uh, Okian Ekwesi from Duke, uh, Ian Byram from uh, Franklin, Tennessee, and, and uh, Pete Chalmers from University of Utah. However, he is joining us from Munich as an ASES traveling fellow, uh, Brett Shook from Mayo Clinic in Jax, and Ryan Sovich from Palm Beach uh, Gardens HSS. Welcome, all of you guys. I'm looking forward to a um, an enjoyable evening. Uh, what we're planning on doing is I'll sort of give a five minute little uh, set the stage and then we'll go into a uh, the conversation about the different thoughts about inlay versus onlay. So this this paper that published by Pascal Bolo and Matthias Umstein uh, showed largely data from Vermont style prosthetics. And what we could see here was a large amount of, uh, you know, a, uh, scapular notching, a uh, reasonable amount of instability, but acromial, stress, acromial and scapular spine fractures were relatively uncommon early on with the Gramont style prosthesis. Uh, the Gramont was great. It needed a few tweaks. Platform systems were starting to get exciting. People wanted to try them out. Notching was becoming a little bit uncomfortable to look at. Our European colleagues initially just said there was a radiographic phenomena, but now we know, thanks to Ryan's work, that it really is a, a, a negative consequence. And deltoid wrapping concept for stability started to get talked about. Uh, Chris Roche and the Zactech design team designed this reverse to try to optimize the different configurations to maximize uh, range of motion without impingement. And this was the original design of the Equinox Reverse, and that, and this is the, the design that is still um, available currently. Uh, it was launched in 2007 as a medial glenoid lateral humeral design. Uh, next shaft angle of 145 onlay to improve motion, reduce notching, and based on what we knew at the time. And since that time, there's been a, a bit of data. These are papers that were published on the Equinox prosthesis. Uh, as you can see here, there's been a few. Um, this is uh, as of March of this year, uh, there were 285 publications on the Equinox prosthesis, 185 clinical studies, 35 computer studies, 23 bench tests, 16 case studies, six registry studies, and one retrieval analysis. So I'd like to say that there isn't an implant out there that has had the tires kicked and checked under the hood as much as this device is uh, and this size of device has been. Uh, what do we know about it? Well, the scapular notchy rates under 10%, instability rates around 1.5%, or chromial fracture rates are under 2%, and it's convertible from an anatomic to reverse 78% of the time. Uh, we published this paper in JBJS about acromial scapular fractures after reverses, and we, we characterized the device as a medialized glenoid and a lateralized humerus. Uh, my biggest regret about this title is that we shouldn't put the word onlay in the title. Uh, so we'll add it in for the purpose of this slide. And what we, what we found in this paper was with over 4,000 shoulders with this onlay device, a fracture rate of 1.7%. The ASES multicenter group looked at over 4,000 patients and they had a 4% rate in a multi-center study. And then when we, we redid our paper with over 9,000 patients. And if we were smarter this time, we put the word onlay in the title, uh, that should help. Uh, what we found in this over 9,000 patients of a rate of 1.5%. Uh, there are some, however, who feel that if we're not if showing a rate of over 4% or around 4% that we're not looking hard enough and that uh, we might be under-reporting this complication in our database. Uh, to counter this, I'd point you to this combined Campbell Clinic and Mayo Clinic paper that's coming out this year at the Academy uh, with 2,600 medial glenoid lateral humeral onlay devices from the Mayo and Campbell Clinics at a rate of 1.8%, which actually matches exactly what we published in JVJS. So we feel a little bit vindicated in this situation. So what does the data show? It does show that lateral humeral onlay components when paired with a medialized or less than five millimeter center of rotation glenoid component has some of the lowest fracture rates reported, period. So 
With that in mind, we have to ask, are we talking apples to apples here? When we look at two different devices that are both considered to be onlay devices, are these the same things? And are, are, is our nomenclature that we're using appropriate? When we look at the differences in what these stems, the stem designs do to the orientation of the shoulder, it gets very confusing. So I'm hoping that Brad Shuck can explain this to us and clarify, you know, Brad, you know, what is an inlay? Is it, a, is it a design? Is it a technique? Is it a philosophical approach to life? Is it a sports team? Is it a religious affiliation? Is, 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 it, is it a cult? Uh, well, what, 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 it, what, is, what is the, is it, what is the inlay, Brad? I think what I can say for sure is that I don't know the answer. I can give you my opinion on it, uh, but it's kind of all over the board when you listen to people talk. For me, what defines an inlay or an onlay is where the pivot point between the glenosphere and the articulation with the polyethylene sits in compared to your cut. So when you try to make a cut along the anatomic neck to get exposure to the glenoid, whether that pivot point sits above or below that cut to me would define an inlay or an onlay. And so this is a perfect example that Howard pulled up here. When with the picture on the right there, you make your humeral head cut right at that green line. And then the pivot point where that glenosphere is articulating with the polyethylene at the red line is above the cut. And on the left with this component cut again at your green line and the pivot point sitting inside of the misaphysis beyond your cut. So to me, on the left, we have an inlay. On the right, we have an onlay. I think that's irrespective of component. It's simply where that pivot point sits in relation to your cut. So inlay and onlay can be based on ultimately the post-operative x-ray. I think so. I think you can't, can't tell until you take your final pictures. Nice. So, so when you look at a stem like this, this uh, when you look at an implant that's been designed like this, is this uh, it, is this an inlay or onlay in terms of its design? Anyway, well, I think this stem is designed as a. I think it's supposed to be an inlay stem as it's designed, uh, look. but you know. There are a lot of features and factors that determine if this stand can be used as the manufacturers would like it to be used. If the pivot point will be truly beneath the anatomic net cut, um, but it is designed to be um, an inlay prosthesis. True. So I, I, I guess to, to, to separating out the, the the implant designer's intentions and the ultimate configuration can separate both the design and the technique side was what Brad was uh, referring to. Uh, you, Ryan, you've said that this this descriptive terminology is really an oversimplification of the issue. Can you walk us through your, your, your the way that you see this? Yeah. So I think, you know, kind of okay. And Brad sort of called attention that, you know, the intention to implant something as an inlay or onlay, um, maybe prosthesis agnostic in the sense that, you know, the things you do control ultimately where that pivot point might be. And I think that's what we're getting at. And so, you know, I think inlay, onlay, the choice of prosthesis is one component that goes into um, your decision-making process, but it's really an oversimplification because there's so many characteristics that control ultimately the care, the things that matter. So when you think of your final x-ray, what are you really looking at? I mean, you're kind of looking at global lateralization, you're looking at distalization, and all those things are controlled by variables, including whether you might choose an inlay or onlay, but whether you might also implant the inlay as an inlay or the onlay truly as an onlay. And those things are controlled by factors like we choose the neck shaft angle, not only of the prosthesis, but potentially of our cut that might control the position of the stem and thereby control where we think we're putting the tray um, and the polyethylene buildup. Uh, the offset of the humerus, you know, controls that, but also again, where we implant the stem may control the true offset of the stem. And if you go to the glenoid side, you know, we all try to preserve the glenoid. So we're not, we're trying not to medialize the glenoid, but that lateralization or where the center rotation is, um, matters and ultimately impacts that global lateralization, distalization. And then you look at sphere size, whether it's eccentricity of the sphere size may increase your distalization. The use of augments is going to control your lateralization. Uh, the way you position the implant is going to control your distalization and then techniques, um, which include version, uh, humeral implant seating, which sometimes is not controlled by us, but controlled by where the, uh, the humeral canal allows 
analysis to put the stem. So I think it's an oversimplification. Uh, it's a bit of a cop out because again, ultimately what we're talking about with all these constructs is we're saying, what is a lateralization? What is a distalization? So, you know, we've talked before about there's some um, interaction between distalization and lateralization. Um, and I have no original thoughts. So I'll sort of give credit to, you know, Joe Zuckerman that came up with this concept of uh, the distalization lateralization index. There's probably some interplay between distalization and lateralization, whether it's a ratio or an index that then can predict patient outcomes more so than any one of those characteristics individually, and certainly more than just saying it's inlay versus onlay, which is often not one of those, we may think it is, but it's not one of those ultimately those post-operative x-rays. Awesome. Thanks for yeah, that. We're, Howard, go back one slide to show that picture. I mean, technique aside, cut aside, in a small patient, if you have a big bowl, you can't inlay it. I mean, there can be patient implant mismatch that doesn't allow a certain implant to be used in the way it was designed. And so that that may even be the case in this picture here. Sorry, sure. There's, there's definitely a wide variety of sizes out there of people that we're working on. Yeah, if you look, I mean, if you look at some of the studies that were done by surgeons that use the inlay, I mean, it's, it's a significant, so it's over half of the implants that were not put in as inlay. So clearly in the best of hands, intending it to be an inlay prosthesis, it's still an onlay type prosthesis. Yeah, when we were doing the uh, uh, the original Encore prosthesis, the, the, the reamer would frequently uh, ream away a lot of the metaphysis and the cortex of that proximal humeral bowl with the original size and it was larger and then they downsized it for a smaller bowl. Uh, but yeah, there's certainly um, some patient specific components that we, we can do a little bit better about. Um, and you know, I'll know, just add that, you know, I think that the, theoretically, you know, the longer a monoblock inlay stem is, the higher the variability you're going to have actually being able to place it inlay because your meta diaphyseal mismatch is this patient to patient. You have a very tight diaphyseal um, uh, canal and a wide diaphyseal canal, you may not be able to get it all the way down. So the longer it is, um, if it's a model block, I think those things sort of get in the way of it being quote unquote an inlay for everybody. Sorry, what? No, I, perfect. You know, I, if, from, from Munich, I'd like to uh, uh, to welcome Peter. Thanks for it. So it is like two in the morning there right now. Thank you. You look fresh for, for 2 a.m. <laughs> Um, it, would, would you, you know, talk us through this concept of design variables that play into complications and trade-offs that we have to you know, work through when we're looking at the different types of implants that are out there? Yeah, thanks, Howard. Thanks, obviously, uh, for having me as well. And I, I, I mean, I agree with a lot of what's been said, but I think, obviously, the definition Brad really specifically and eloquently laid out is the definition that we're all using for how you define inlay versus onlay. I think the important thing to mention there, and I think Ryan nicely touched upon this, is that the cut is another factor, and the cut is a surgeon modifiable factor. So if you say that the stem is defined as inlay or onlay relative to the cut, the cut is not the cut is not an anatomic factor. The cut is a surgeon modifiable factor. The, the cut can be placed lower by the surgeon, and then if you inlay the component relative to that, you may have your stem, stem more distalized. And then there's this other factor that you you laid out in this prior in the prior radiograph so nicely, which is that the design of the metaphyseal portion of the stem may prevent you from inlaying a component that's designed to be made as an inlay if there is differences in the proximity or not. So if it's a smaller diaphysis, it's a more wide metaphysis, you may end up with a stem that sits higher. So I think it's really important to acknowledge here when we talk about inlay versus onlay that we're defining it not relative to the anatomy, but relative to the surgeon's technique in the placement of the implant. So I personally think inlay versus onlay, this is a technique. This is not an implant inherent factor. This is not an anatomic inherent factor. And then we have to consider with all these other variables, and this is the the picture you so nicely let out for lateralized humerus versus glenoid, and that obviously gives us our two by two table with the four factors you've mentioned here. And then you have to consider that also again with next shaft angle because probably one of the only components on the market that is truly a inlay is also a 135 next shaft angle. And that, that changes also the distalization and lateralization of the humerus relative to the center of rotation. Excellent. So well, let's talk about the, uh, the 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 different things that happen when you change your glenoid side at lateralization. Uh, this is a, a couple of papers from Alicia Kerrigan, who was a resident with George Athwal 
um, in Canada and is now a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. But prior to that, she published these two really nice papers that looked at the influence of the reverse design and the impact it had on scapular spine strain. And what she found was that um, it, as you lateralize the glenoid component, that the strain itself increases in the zone two of Levy fractures, which is the most common location where we see these fractures. And separately, if you look at humeral lateralization, that the strain actually decreases. Uh, so um, unfortunately, um, it doesn't appear as though these two things cancel themselves out. It would be nice if you could get decreased strain in the chromium from lateralizing the humerus and increased strain from lateralizing the glenoid, and they would cancel each other, itself out and not really have that problem, but it doesn't appear to be that way. The medialized glenoid appears to be the most gentle on the chromium based on the historical data of the Grimaud and on the papers that we've written on. And also the lateral uh, humerus appears to be the most gentle on the chromium of the two different devices. Uh, and this leads us to this picture here on the left, which is what we would call a, a double lateralized or a lateralized glenoid with a lateralized humerus device at the same time. Um, and they, sometimes this can be a little bit unintentional, if the bio RSA is being used for 100% of the cases, as it was as it was advocated for for a period of time in Europe, uh, that it's not really thought of as being a lateralization component, uh, similar to a uh, an augment. Uh, but if you lateralize on both sides in the at risk individual, it could be problematic. Okay, we have already talked a little bit about tight and small shoulders. Uh, wh wh what's been your experience with the use of uh, inlays, and particularly in these smaller individuals? Well, yeah, thank you, Howard. You know, I agree with everything that's been said. I certainly agree with what, uh, you know, Peter said. I think, you know, it's about using the right implant for the right patient. And if you choose to use one implant, you have to have different techniques. You probably have to have a thought process about what the risk factor is going to be. Um, certainly, you know, I've been someone who's used many different implants. I've used inlay, onlay, different brands. And early in my career, you know, when I wasn't thinking critically enough, I would just sort of use the same sort of glenosphere for every patient. And, um, you know, with my lateral glenosphere era, you know, I noted that um, I started having a few acromial fractures that I felt were very preventable. And that was what really upset me. You know, you have an 82 year old lady, and I put a, you know, plus six uh, glenosphere, plus eight, and then she fractured. So, you know, and I know, and I think we all know, um, with some small patients, we may put a medialized construct, a medialized planisphere. I cannot say that I've seen um, inferior results. I haven't studied it formally. Uh, it is possible that you may see a little bit more scapular notching, but I do think that you have to be thoughtful about your particular patient and thoughtful about what implants you're gonna use for that patient. And if you don't change your implant, you have to think about how you change your technique to accommodate that patient safely. Excellent. Yep. So currently when you're when you're looking at the construct that you use for the non at risk individual, what's the you know what where do you make your decisions? Are you starting off with a standard lettuce here for most folks and then you know working lateral based on how big how much dead space they have? We talked earlier before the call started about this soft tissue envelope and this tensioning uh, idea of dead space that needs to get filled. Where do you where do you usually try to fill your dead space from the glenoid side or the humeral side? I like I like the uh, I like the idea of you know the lateralized humerus but medialized glenoid and you know I think obviously you know your paper you know sort of highlighted uh, some very important factors and then you think about the moment arm and a lot of people may not understand, you know, when you lateralize the glenosphere, the simple way of thinking about it would be to say, well, we lateralize the glenosphere, the delta is under more tension uh, because it has more of a mechanical advantage, but you have more resting tension. When you have this prolonged resting tension and then you have this higher activation energy, you get, you have more chromial fractures. So with the current design, you know, you can get the same amount of lateral, the global lateralization, but with better moment arm, with decreased um, activation energy, which ultimately results in higher efficiency for the deltoid. Now to your question about what would I do if I was concerned, I would prefer usually to work on lateralization. Um, the good thing about our current system is that if you go up in the poly, you are not just lengthening, you're still lateralizing. If you lateralize in the glenosphere, you're lateralizing as well. 
Uh, so if I was getting into a position where I felt like I was really concerned about say instability and I felt like I needed increased tension, I would prefer to probably, you know, lateralize off the glenosphere because I know that our, our, uh, our chances of fracturing is going to be less because we're not just focusing on lengthening. I think the worst is when you have a lateralized implant on the glenosphere side plus a lengthened humerus because of the, the tray. I think that's a double negative and you can't win. You go up on the, on the uh, poly or over length today, you go up on the glenosphere, you still make it worse. So long with an answer and uh, you know, I hope that makes some sense. No, oh, great answer. It's great to see uh, your, your thought process. I uh, wanted to throw it over to Ian because I think that you know, is is one Ian is is one of these better than the other? Is inlay bad and onlay good, or uh, are are we are we missing the point? Yeah, I think unfortunately we are missing the point. And and as everyone has mentioned, and uh, I appreciate you letting me chime in on this because. I get frustrated by this bimodal nomenclature that's been developed and essentially fueled by industry. And the reality is there is not one system that is a purely onlay versus inlay. There are many factors that can be modified by technique, as Peter mentioned, or by implant design, as you mentioned in the beginning. Um, and ultimately, what I would like to do and see us do is create more of a patient-specific modifiable implant um, that can then meet the demands of different patients. So if it's a patient that's too small, yet you still want to have, you know, a pivot point that's within the metaphysis, then you need to have an inlay potential with a smaller bowl or tray. On the flip side, if it's a big patient uh, and we really want to lateralize on the humeral side, uh, we need to make sure that those, those factors are modifiable in that implant. So um, bottom line is not all patients are the same size. Not all humeral osteotomies are the same. And if you're a surgeon that's used to making an osteotomy at a certain place, whether it's at the anatomic neck or slightly below, you will then have to modify your technique if you use a different stem. So as people kind of bounce around, use different implants, and there, there may be times that you end up using a different style implant for an entirely different reason. You know, maybe they already have uh, a glenosphere that's well fixed and you're having to change over the, the humeral stem for some reason. You just have to take all these factors uh, into account. And, and that's why I just don't think that it's fair to just classify one implant as purely onlay or purely inlay. Um, but hopefully we can work toward a solution that, that meets some of the same uh, goals uh, with without having to change the whole nomenclature, um, you know, just by using it in a different way. So uh, bottom line is it's not bimodal. We shouldn't listen to that. Now, that being said, as we hear these terms, inlay, flush lay, mid lay, on lay, all play, all day, parlay, you know, we got to just get back to the basics and, and make sure that we're tensioning properly and not increasing the risk of acromial fractures and other uh, complications like notching. Awesome. Thank you. And you know, I think that, you know, if we're going to try to take away something from this is that it's complicated. It's definitely multifactorial. It's not as simple as a uh, bimodal distribution of these are the results of inlay and these are the results of monlay. Uh, we know that the in, that the lateral humeral medial glenoid onlay design for the equinox prosthesis have, it has been heavily studied and can stand on its data. But I think that if we're going to be uh, educated consumers of reverse arthroplasty uh, publications, I think it's important if you see a paper that just shows data that's related to one side of the joint. If someone shows a humeral and they're pointing a figure at the humeral side, the first question that we need to ask is, well, how is the glenoid side handled in this situation? Because it's not just one side of the joint that makes up the overall mechanics of the prosthesis. The, the final words that I uh, wanted to share and can really get the panel to chime in on um, is, is uh, you know, when you were talking about um, lateralizing on the glenoid side, that, that for me, I think that it might be younger patients, male, good bone and good cuff. I think that might be a great uh, indication because those are the folks that don't necessarily, um, there really aren't at risk for the acromial fracture uh, or complication, but are more at risk for an instability uh, uh, complication. Uh, thoughts on this, Peter? Uh, any, anyone else from the, from the group want to chime in on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a 
And that's a great point. But I think to, to say that, we have to basically acknowledge that acromial stress fractures are likely multifactorial in origin. And one of the origins is the bone quality. So in patients with osteoporosis, there's clearly an increased risk. And those are the patients we need to worry about the most. Obviously, the young male patient is not the patient where you need to worry about it. So that's one thing that I think is, you know, because that patient's going to have good bones. So you, you have those as the first three things. I think when you combine those first two, two things, you know that the third thing is going to be true. And then the good cuff one, I think, is really interesting. And I um, this, is this I think, is our emerging understanding of chromial stress fractures, stress fractures, which is that there's one aspect of it that may be tension related, but that's probably not the only explanation. And that one of the explanations is that acromial stress fractures are related to demand. And here's what I mean by that. So when you have a deltoid that pulls more on the acromion, it puts more stress on the on the scapular spine. When you have a good rotator cuff, then the rotator cuff helps to elevate the arm. The acromion doesn't, the deltoid doesn't have to all the work, so the acromion doesn't see as much stress. So that's the reason why that last one matters. So in that elderly patient, that's much more likely the patient that you're doing the reverse for a rotator cuff to arthropathy. That patient has no rotator cuff, so the deltoid is doing all. So we've had a question. And that's uh, where I think the lateralized humerus really comes to play. Mm -hmm. Because of the lateralized humerus, you put the deltoid in more advantage. There's less deltoid pull. And I think that's part of the reason why you're going to see such a low acromial stress fracture rate with a lateralized humerus type implant like you have with this implant. Howard, uh, yeah. I was gonna, I was gonna add one thing. You know, so all these individual factors, you know, we kind of consider in isolation. And I would imagine that you know, at some point in the future, we'll get to the the, the aspect of predictive analytics, where you know, we've got these preoperative X-rays, we've got the patient, we've got the soft tissue sleeve. All these things are things that are individual components, but all cumulatively result in the increased risk of acromial stress fracture. And so, intuitively, if we collect enough data, we'll be able to predict which patient needs what implant and where you could lateralize or not lateralize on the glenoid, where it might be helpful or not helpful. Uh, so hopefully that's where in the future, you know, these are kind of general principles that will be able to be better guided by the research that's ongoing. Uh, you, know, you, you imagine a, a future state of uh, pre-oplating software uh, and, and not only analyzing the uh, uh, the bony configuration of the scapula, but also looking at the soft tissue and looking at a number of different things that are very patient specific. And as you raise and lower your humeral osteotomy, you see the complication rates change in the preoperative planning software. So you have a, uh, some guidance in terms of what to avoid for that specific individual. Uh, I think we're like a two years away from that uh, that 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 going live. It should be exciting. Uh, we did have a question pop up from the audience asking um, specifically, can you explain how an inlay device has a higher resting tension than an onlay? Um, uh, okay, you, did, you, you want to uh, uh, clarify that? Well, you know, I think it's the, uh, it's the idea of, of, of a, mo I don't want to get too detailed about this, but it's the idea of the, the, the moment arm. I think if you have uh, high moment arm, which we have because the moment arm is simply the distance between the center of rotation and the force. So the deltoid. So if you have a large moment arm, then in our case, we are rested because we're not jacking out the, um, deltoid with the glenosphere. It's fairly relaxed, but when you need it activated, your moment arm gets enough enough force to get your arm up without the same kind of stress. If you're globally just lateralized, your center of rotation is lateralized, your distance from the center of rotation to the deltoid is a lot less. As a result, your moment arm is less, but your deltoid is constantly under more tensions because of the lateralization of the glenosphere. So it's a combination of the resting tension, but I think it's more importantly the efficiency, which just simply means how much force do you sort of have to generate to get the arm up? And if you have a good moment arm, you have a more efficient deltoid. And when you raise the arm, you're not having the same sort of stresses as you would in another situation. That's just sort of how I how I view it. Obviously, you would need certain kind of tests to prove that out, but that's how I've always looked at it. Brad, you look as though you got something that on your mind. Yeah, I mean, what Oki's saying is exactly right. It's just, it's a teeter-totter analogy. The further you move away from the middle of the pivot point, the easier it is to lift the other side. So if you have a lateralized glenosphere, you're essentially moving the middle of that teeter-totter 
closer to you. So you have to weigh more or generate more force to lift the other side of the teeter totter or your arm. So that's, I think the easiest way to think about it. So a medialized glenoid, as you point out, Howard, it'd be you know, less than five millimeters decreases our risk of an acromial stress fracture. So you want to keep the distance between your center of rotation and your deltoid as large as possible within reason to to take care of your chromium so you don't end up overstressing it and fracturing it. This plays perfectly into the next question I wanted to ask. So, um, so when we looked at this accumulating risk factor paper uh, that we I, I mentioned earlier that Ryan, Chris, and a number of us put together, we found that we, we all know that the elderly female inflammatory arthropathy and cuff deficiency are the main risk factors that we are looking for for acromial stress fractures. When we looked at over 9,000 patients of ours, the overall rate was 1.5% for all comers. But when you break this down into a little bit more detail, you can see that for males, it was 0.8. For rheumatoid arthritis, it was 3.4. For cuff jar arthropathy, it was just over 2. But when you take three different variables and stack them on top of each other, if you look at the bottom here, and I'll blow this up, Rheumatoid arthritic, rheumatoid arthritic female over the age 75 had a 10% rate of acromial stress fractures. Okay, so I guess the question that just to chime in across the panel is when you, this patient comes into your office, and I think we've already started to talk about this a little bit, but when the patient comes into your office and they have this combination of diagnoses and you know that this person is wearing a shirt that says, I'm the one that's going to break, okay? Like what are the things that you're doing in terms of implant selection, in terms of surgical technique, in terms of post-operative care, length of immobilization. Uh, Ian, you know, what, what, what do you do when, when, when the, I'm gonna break my acromion patient walks in and you're gonna still, still go forward with the operation or do you do something totally different anyway? Um, well, if, if I've already tried to send them to you and you send them back, then I agree to operate on them. And then ultimately we have to go back to the data, which we know that it, the more you lateralize on the glenosphere side, the more likely you are to put this patient at risk. So the whole movement of lateralization on the glenosphere side is anti Grammont. You know, it's anti the whole reason a, re a reverse was created. So we, we did that, or that was created to try and minimize scapular notching. Well, I'm not really worried about scapular notching as much in the 75 or 80 year old rheumatoid female. They're not gonna put so many reps on their shoulder that that's how the, they're gonna fail. They're gonna fail from an acromial fracture. So this is the patient where I'm going to be more medialized on the glenosphere side. I will give some slight inferior overhang as opposed to putting it right in the middle. Um, but, and then I'll make a bigger humeral osteotomy. And then you can even modify your humeral osteotomy a little bit um, if you need to with regard to the angle uh, in order to make an adequate neck shaft angle. Um, because the problem with some of these implant that are quote unquote inlay is that they're just 135 degrees and then that's it all the time. So in order, if you have a 135 degree neck shaft angle, you will have to lateralize in the glenosphere side in order to get adequate tension unless you build it up massively on the humeral side which in turn will also lengthen you, which also puts more stress on this rotator cuff arthropathy patient. So it's kind of this circle, you're chasing your tail. So you have to start on the glenosphere side before you can even think about the humeral side. And in doing that, I'm not gonna put a lateralized glenosphere on the glenoid side and then have to deal with those consequences. So medialized glenosphere, bigger osteotomy, stay away from using a more varus cut in order to make up for for your lack for your tension you know can i just add something yes i'm sorry you know i think this is something that that sort of concerns me and i think that we may see more chromial fractures as we go forward not with an exact because i think that these at-risk patients in my experience tend to have a lot more superior inclination erosion you know rotator arthropathy and we're seeing more augments used. Um, one of the things that stood out of your study, which was a classic study, was that there was no increased risk with the augments, with the augment groups. If you look at other papers, there's a paper out of Rothman, they use a different type of augments. You know, I think it had like 11% acromial fracture rate at one year. Um, 
because I mean, you can only postulate why part of it might be the augment is too large. And when it's too large, you also have a problem getting it all the way flush. So it's too large and then it's a little proud. You're lo- you, you lose accuracy. Now we've oversimplified it. Oh, you have some severe inclination. We're just going to put an augment on. So I, I actually think you have to also think the same way. Like, okay, well, if I'm going to use an augment, which you may need in this population, okay, what kind of augment am I going to use? How much do I want to lateralize past the native joint line? How much do patient tolerate? Um, so I think there are other things that you probably want to think about in this group. So in this group, I'm, I'm, I'm very thoughtful about how I use augments and, and what I want to accept. And this is definitely one plug for preoperative planning. So use a software that tells you your distalization, that tells you your lateralization. You can look at how far an augment's going to lateralize you. If it's going to lateralize you too much, even then you can switch it. You can medialize and ream down on the glenoid a little bit more. There are trade-offs. If you want to try to get below that five millimeter magic number, do we know that's the magic number? No, but that appears to be what it is for right now. So you can use your preoperative planning to kind of plan where you want things. And if you want to take it up a notch, then use some type of instrumentation that'll help you put it exactly where you plan it, you know, navigation. So all those things, you can control those surgeon modifiable risk factors, reduce your patient's risk with a little forethought in the preoperative time frame. Yeah, Peter, Ryan, uh, do, uh, let's start with Peter. Are there any other like the surgical uh, considerations, things you're doing in the operating room that haven't been mentioned or thoughts that you want to add to the intraop? And uh, maybe we'll talk about the postoperative considerations for these individuals as well. Yeah, I mean, one thing I would add is um, this data, and we've replicated this data with our, we have a paper, publication about this nearest Utah too, to show that the the rheumatoid patient is at very, very high risk. This has caused it, my institution us to push back into anatomic. So if I see a rheumatoid patient who's 75 years or older and the MRI shows the cuff is intact, I will push to do an anatomic in that patient. Because then, I mean, you know, I know, you want to know the largest way to reduce your criminal stress fracture risk is don't do a reverse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Excellent point. And in a patient who's over the age of 75, the likelihood that the patient's glenoid will come loose before the patient um, will die of other causes is very low. So I, to me, the rheumatoid patient that's younger is the one that I need to worry about. But in an older patient, I think the number one thing to do is, you know, reconsider your choice of implant. Excellent yeah, Peter, Peter, to echo that, I mean, we've all seen that skeletonized, frail, elderly female patient and, and they have a reverse and it looks, the x-ray looks great. But you're, you're staring at their acromion, and, and that patient may not be made for a reverse. I totally agree with you. So, uh, Ryan, I, I, I put in an inset uh, glenosphere uh, l- last week, uh, specifically in this individual, in, in that type of individual. Um, there is a special glenosphere uh, with this device that has a center of rotation that is inside the vault of, this, uh, of the glenoid. Um, it makes the, the moment arm even longer. Do you use that or are there any other things that you that, that haven't been mentioned that uh, could be helpful here? Yeah, I think I used it once. I haven't used it as much as you, uh, mostly just because I, I feel like the size of it, just because um, it's a, what, just 46, but inset, right? So mm-hmm. it's uh, it's just a big glenosphere, although it makes complete sense. And it's just be a perfect patient if it's appropriately sized for the glenoid. Um, so I think that's that's a nifty thing. The uh, and I think you know you kind of alluded to the post-operative treatment. I mean, it's a patient I treat differently. So you, know, you and I have philosophical differences between sometimes rehab versus no rehab. This would be the patient for me that you know rehab is probably their worst enemy. You know, and to send them to a therapist, they're going to wind up in a chromial stress fracture. So it's one that I would keep in the sling a little bit longer. I probably let them wean out of it uh, over a longer period of time, thinking that the bone's going to kind of acclimate to the stress better. Uh, give them some home exercises. Tell them that you know we're not looking for a slam dunk. We're just looking for them to get better. And then uh, just kind of going back to think, I think what Brad was talking about that, um, you know, I don't, we don't have the capacity yet, but the, the planning software, you know, again, that distalization, lateralization. So what I'll tell you is that, um, you know, we looked at the data and it was, and it was looking at an Equinox and also DJO. So it's kind of the two systems, you know, the quote unquote onlay versus inlay. And there was this clear demarcation where you got to the certain index, which was around 25 based on how we computed it, where the stress, uh, stress fracture rate went up higher. And so, you know, it's probably going to be the case that, that we can make some some uh, conclusions prior to the events happening of what's likely to happen if we mess with their lateralization too much on the glenoid side or we distalize them too much on the humerus side in combination. 
Fantastic. Thanks so much. Uh, any other closing thoughts as we're coming up on 57 minutes? I think this has been fantastic. I've learned a lot from each and every one of you. Any other comments that you guys are can't wait to get out? All right. Well, with that, I thank you all for being here. I thank our attendees for being here. I want to thank Exactech for sponsoring this. We wish everyone a, a great evening. Have a great night.